Hello. Is someone hearing me? Hello, yes. Uh, this is Diana speaking from UN Women. This is Lisa, right? Yes, okay, yes, this is Lisa. Okay, Perfect. great, I'm connected Perfect. Now. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> I'm, so... I'm, I'm happy. So we are all online. We are starting the webinar in one minute. And okay. um, as for now, I'll, uh, we will be muting uh, all the panelists and mm -hmm. uh, we will start. You mute it from your side. I don't mute it from my side. Is that it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can do this as well. <laughs> no problem. No, no, I'm just asking who, who mutes, <laughs> whether it's me or you. Either way, but if you can do it from your side, this will be perfect. Okay, let me just see. Where am I doing this? Um, there is like a taskbar with a microphone, yeah. a camera. So you just click on that and it becomes red. Really? Um, Okay. Ah. Hello. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um. We appreciate your patience while we uh, um, had some connection issues and fixes. So we are ready to start the webinar. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, dear participants, and Happy New Year. Uh, we would like to uh, congratulate with you, uh, the new year, 2019, and we wish you all the best, prosperity, happiness, and professional success. <laughs> and we hope this year will be full of webinars with good collaborations, and we hope we will see you today and in every other month when we will have interesting topics to discuss and to receive your questions and to receive your opinions and feedback. And we are ready to also respond to any topic that you would like to discuss further in more details. But for today, we have an exciting, exciting topic, and we are very happy on behalf of UN Newman, ILO, and the European Union, to and all the panelists and the participants and everyone who worked for this session to welcome you at the webinar one uh, in 2019. And the topic is Achieving Equal Pay Lessons from ILO 2018-2019 Global Wage Report and Global Stakeholders. You probably wonder who is this voice and who is this person? <laughs> My name is Diana Russo. I'm an innovation and knowledge management for women economic empowerment. And uh, I will be your moderator today. I'm looking forward to receive interesting questions and uh, to facilitate this discussion with our wonderful panelists. So um, I hope you are ready and let's go on. But of course, before we move to our presentations, um, I would like to present you the agenda. First, we will have some wel welcome remarks. Then we will go to the presentation one and uh, from ILO, presented by Rosalia Vasquez Alvarez. Second presentation, also from ILO, Lisa Wong. Presentation number three, Akustina Morni, from um, International Organization of Employees. Then we will have Chris Martin from Starbucks and Sari Brody from IKEA to have some interesting study cases and share a bit more about their work. And we will have an interesting session of question and answers and we will have some closing remarks from our partners at ILO as well. Just for you to know, if you have any questions during a webinar, you can enter your question into the question pane for the organizer or the panelist. You may also click on the hand a little icon if you would like to uh, ask your question using the voice um, and we will be happy to interact with you during the Q&A sessions. Either way is fine. Um, we are welcome to collaborate whatever way it's more convenient and interesting and useful for you. And now, on behalf of um, We Empower team, who is the organizer of this webinar, I would like to invite Anna Feld from We Empower uh, team, a program manager, to um, share some welcoming remarks. 
Thank you very much, uh, Diana. Um, my name is Anna Feld. I'm the manager of the We Empower program. And uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for those who are in Europe uh, or elsewhere in the world. Um, I would like to be very, very brief because we have many interesting uh, panelists that will uh, present their work. Uh, but I just wanted to welcome everyone on behalf of both UN Women, ILO, and the European Union. Uh, we, as Diana mentioned, we have this exciting program that has uh, two tracks. Uh, one is to convene all of you into both webinars and in-person uh, dialogues uh, to discuss women's economic empowerment, specifically in the G7 countries, but also in the broader EU. Um, that can benefit also the, the rest of the world. Um, and these good practices uh, that we are emerging in these dialogues is also something that we will uh, like to collect from, from you uh, during the course of this program. We also have a second track where we are focusing in on both uh, companies through our women's empowerment principles as well as women entrepreneurs. Um, to support and advance this agenda. But as I said, I don't want to be uh, very lengthy, uh, but we are very excited um, today to focus on equal pay, and uh, which is one of the areas of implementation under the Women's Empowerment Principles, and also a very important topic driven by the ILO. So we have different perspectives today from ILO on how they are addressing uh, equal pay uh, for work of equal value. So thank you so much, and uh, over to you, Diana. Thank you, Anna. As Anna mentioned, equal pay is an important to you, your employers, and for the future. Pay system that are transparent and reward the entire workforce fairly send a positive message about an organization value and ways of working. We have an exciting panelist today who will bring different perspective. But before that, we would like to ask you several questions. This will help our panelists to respond better uh, and wh while doing their presentation, but also will indicate us what level of information we will uh, give today now for the presentation and through our answers to your questions. So if you don't mind, we will start with question number one. I am from you have several choices Canada, US, G7 countries like France, Germany, Italy, Japan, or UK, other EU country. We are welcome all of you or any other country in the world. Non in EU and definitely non in G7 countries. So 75% voted. We'll wait a little bit more. Again, please indicate your response. Eighty percent of the participant voted. Ten more seconds. It seems that we do have a lot of participants from the global um, non-EU and non-G7 countries, but we do have uh, good representations from US, from G7, mainly France, Germany, and Italy, but very curious um, what will be the final result, results. So, um, we welcome the participants from US, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, other EU countries, 13%, and then global audience. Thank you for joining us. Um, our second question is, 
I identify as woman, man, or other. I think this was an easy click. We do have 91 percent of women joining today for the webinar and we have nine percent of men. Thank you. And let's go with the next question. I work in academia, government, business, private sector, media, civil society, or employees organization, workers organization. Sixty five percent already voted. We'll wait a little bit more. But it's already clear that um, a big part of our stakeholders come from businesses and another big part from civil society. Okay. We close. Thank you. And the last question. Please indicate how informed are you with the policies on equal pay? Highly informed, informed, somehow informed? But, or you would like and you hope to get the information that you need today. Seventy-five percent of our stakeholders voted. Ten more seconds. Thank you for your vote. Um, and thank you for indicating um, the level of information. I hope this will uh, help our panelists to present a little bit more and to tailor the information um, based on the responses and uh, geographical area of interest and institution um, affiliation um, that our panel uh, participants represent today. And to kick off, um, the, our presentations and wonderful discussion, we are inviting Rosalia Vasquez Alvarez from ILO to share the main results of the Global Wage Report 2018-2019. Uh, Rosalia is an econometrician and wage specialist working at the, um, in work branch at the ILO in Geneva. Prior to that, she worked as an economic advisor for the government of Dubai and as a quantitative labor economist for the World Bank. More about herself and about her work, we will invite Rosalia to tell us more. Rosalia, up to you. Uh, yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you would like me to to start with the presentation, is that right? Yes, yes. Okay, so well, thank you very much everybody who uh, came uh, on board to to listen to this presentation. It's actually quite impressive to see that it's almost 200 people uh, online. So I hope I can do a good job at presenting the what we call the Global Wage Report. Now, before I present the results, I would like to say something about it. Um, am I able to move myself the slides? Uh, we will kindly uh, help you, but if you want, sure, we can facilitate this. Um, that would be actually quite good if I could do that. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is to give you a few words about the report. 
Uh, this is the Global Wage Report. It's one of the ILO flagships. Uh, there are four flagships at the ILO, and this is one of them. It's a biennial publication that started in 2008 and is now in the sixth edition. Basically, this one is called Global Wage Report, What Lies Behind the Gender Pay Gap, because in each of the reports, the first part is always looking at regional and global wage trends. The second part looks at a specific quantitative topic. This time is the gender pay gap. It always has to be related to wages. And then the third part of the report is basically the policy conclusions or policy evaluation based on the first two parts, which are always uh, empirical by nature. So basically today uh, we're going to look at the report. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, Rosalia, um, per yeah. your request, we kindly provided you the access to the presentation. So, okay. um, if you can launch it from your end. Um, uh, yes, I... If not, we can continue from here. Uh, yeah, the thing is that I've lost the screen now. I can see the... the I can see the the board, the, the screen. Mm -hmm. the... Okay, so no problem. We will we will continue from here. Um, okay. um, I hope this is okay. Apologies, everyone, for a small technical challenge. Yeah, I can see. Okay, so uh, okay, so basically, uh, as I said at the end of this current slide, what we will be presenting today is part two the basic results of part two because part two is quite extensive and it's also very much a great deal of methodology but i will skip that i will just go straight into the res uh, the results so if we go to the next slide please okay so how does the report contribute to better understanding the gender pay gap now this is an important question because if we think about the amount of work that has been written on the gender pay gap, one could question why another report. Okay, so the first thing is that the report provides a global picture of the gender pay gap because we have used data, micro data from about 70 countries, and this covers about 80% of wage employees worldwide. And we have used the homogeneous treatment of the data so to come up with estimates that are comparable between countries. So that's the first thing that we can think of as the contribution of this report with respect to everything that has been written in terms of the gender pay gap. The second thing is in methodology. We actually question the usual way of estimating the gender pay gap. And what we do is we provide a new method, a new alternative to estimate gender pay gaps, difference between men and women in terms of earnings, that somehow corrects, corrects for some of the bias that were attached to the, like, to the classic measures. And I will explain that a little bit later. The third thing is that we say, okay, estimating the gender pay gap, just one number is not sufficient. What we should do is to go through a process that involves various things. And this can be not just the measure, but actually the distribution of wages, the decomposition, and then expl uh, trying to explore the unexplained part of the gender pay gap. And then finally, what we do is by exploring the unexplained part, we look at the motherhood gap, at the effect of feminization of particular sectors on the gender pay gap, and occupational segregation. So now we go into the next slide. Okay, now what is this? Okay, what we find here is using these 70 countries that I said before, which, as I said, represent about 80% of wage employees worldwide and a homogeneous treatment, we have actually in the report estimated the mean, the median of the gender pay gap using hourly wages, monthly earnings, and regional estimates. So as you can see here, no, let's go back to the previous slide. No, don't, let's not move from here. As you can see here, the vast majority of countries do have a positive gender pay gap. A positive gender pay gap is anything that goes above the gray line, the horizontal gray line. On average, you would say using the mean hourly wage is about 16% globally, the gender pay gap, although you have a great deal of uh, diversity between them because you have Korea, for example, which is about 35, but down here you have Uruguay, which is close to zero. But then another thing is that we have estimates that are negative. So it's about 16 countries for which we estimate that the gender pay gap is negative. So we can now go, go to the next slide. 
Now, another thing that we like to point out is that whether we estimate the mean gender pay gap or the medium gender pay gap can bring about quite a great deal of difference in terms of results. For example, in the case of Namibia, with the mean gender pay gap, we have a positive outcome, but with the median gender pay gap, we have a negative outcome. Now, we go to the next slide. So what is it that we're going to say? Well, for about 75% of the countries, using the mean and median gender pay gap, would give different policy conclusions. And that's the usual way in which we go about to estimate the gender pay gap. So how can we reconcile these estimates, this gender pay gap, uh, uh, in terms, uh, to be policy relevant uh, as a measure for guidelines? The second thing that we find is that for 16 countries, women's hourly wage is actually higher than for men's hourly wage. And all of these are middle and low income countries. So are women wage employees in middle and low income countries any more than men? So that's the second question that we ask with this set of results. Now we go to the next slide. Okay, so we see that using data from about 70 countries, if there is a negative gender pay gap, we find that women's participation as wage employees is low. If the gender pay gap, mean and media are very different, what we find is that the data tells us that women are clustered in a specific wage ranges. The clusters, the mean or the median, dominates or it's biased by, uh, by these clusters, this, this summary. And therefore, these summary measures are weak at describing the rather complex or irregular wage distribution for women and men. Therefore, the mean and the median are not good measures to be compared to estimate pay difference between men and women. That's one of the findings of the Global Wage Report. Now we go to the next slide. So the idea is what can be done to eliminate these composition effects. Okay, we take as example Costa Rica. In Costa Rica, if we take the complete population, we see that men's hourly wage on average is about 2,473 uh, pesos per uh, uh, units, local currency units per hour, whereas women is 2,641. So just comparing the mean value on hourly wage between men and women, we come up with a gender pay gap that is negative. It seems that women are earning more. But now if we actually distribute the population according to educational background, so we look at the gender pay gap among those who have primary, those who have lower education, those who have high school, or those who have university plus, we estimate that actually within these subgroups in terms of education, men are earning more than women. So within subgroup of education, the gender pay gap is actually positive, meaning that men earn more than women. Now, what happens is that among those who are university graduates, we observe we have a significant number of women, and this significant number of women are earning quite, a, quite more than the rest of other women. So there, the fact that we have 35% of women in this group, these 35% of women are pushing the hourly wage very high up for everyone, but they don't represent everyone in the population, they just represent 35%, whereas the other 65% seem to earn much less. Nevertheless, this biasing effect that these women have on the average implies that the average mean gender pay gap, the mean gender pay gap is negative. Now, if we take each of the groups and we estimate the gender pay gap for each of the groups, and then we weight the representation of this gender pay gap within education by the sample size, we estimate what we call the gender pay gap weighted by the factor education to be 10.9. So basically, when we estimate a gender pay gap that is negative, what we're really finding is that there is a biasing effect because there are subgroups of women that cluster the particular wages, and this subgroup of women do not represent the overall uh, women in the population, but are biasing the number. So if we go to the next slide now. What can we think in terms of factors that can be considered to estimate the factor with the gender pay gap? Because it's not just education. We can think of education and age because these are the two key variables in terms of the human capital factors, where age is a way of uh, simulating experience in the labor market. And then gender factor driven can be thought in terms of part-time, full-time, because there is a tendency for women to participate in part-time, and private versus, versus pu public sector, because there's also a division of women, men, 
pub in, uh, in terms of the uh, par private and public sector. So if we take into account these four factors, we can come up with 64 subgroups in the population. For each of these subgroups, we estimate the gender pay gap, and then each subgroup it's contributing with its own weight in terms of how they uh, measure in the population to estimate what we call the factor weighted gender pay gap. So if we go to the next slide now. Okay, so now what we find is the green values are the mean factor weighted gender pay gap, and the mean and the blue ones are the ones that we have estimated before, just the classic way of estimating the gender pay gap. So the first thing we see is that on average, Globally, the gender pay gap using the mean factor gender pay gap using the four factors that we have mentioned before has gone up to about 20%. Instead of about 16%, it's now 20%. But then those countries that are signaled here as negative with the factor with the gender pay gap come out to be positive. So that's the first finding. The second finding is next slide. Is that there is an out, no, the previous, well, basically, no, the previous one the previous one. Now, we can see there is a, the, in this block here, which is red, there's an alignment of gender pay gaps around the world, except a few outliers, that will go between 10 and 25 percent. So that's the next thing. And then the next slide shows that there's, with the factor with the gender pay gap, using either the mean or the median, we find that there is a quite similarity whichever one we use. So basically, with the factor with the gender pay gap, now we go to the next slide, we've, we've actually corrected the effect that clustering of women have in particular subgroups in the population, specifically in low and middle income countries where there is low participation on behalf of women. So what we say is that there is a great deal of advantage of using this factor with the gender pay gap because the factors are somehow already available at data sets. It's no longer controversial whether we use the mean or the median. For example, in the example we gave before, which was Namibia, we had the mean and the median, which had a, a different sign. So policymakers could use one or the other according to what we, they may want to put forward as message. With the factor with the gender pay gap, we find that both mean and media are fairly close and they have the same sign. And then it's better to compare the evolution of gender pay gaps using a, a factor with the gender pay gap because since we are controlling for those variables that determines the participation of men and women in the labor market, we are actually controlling for composition effects in the population. And finally, we can also show that this factor weight the gender pay gap is a much better way of comparing uh, uh, the gender pay gap between countries and as well as over time. So we go to the next slide. Now, another thing that we say in the report is that Usually when we talk about gender pay gaps, the difference between men and women's pay, we look just as a, as a number. But in reality, a number cannot really tell you the, feel, the full picture. And here we have four examples. What we have done is to estimate the gender pay gap at different deciles of the wage distribution, from those who pay the low, get the lowest pay to those who get the highest pay in 10 different brackets or range of values. What we find is, for example, Spain, Norway, Egypt, and Peru. And for all of them, the gender pay gap is quite similar, 14%, 12%, 13%, 16%. That's the mean gender pay gap. Now, what happens if we look, for example, in terms of Spain, we find that the gender pay gap is fairly similar whether we look at the low decile or at the higher decile. For all of these deciles, the gender pay gap is similar and relatively high. If we look at Norway, we find that the gender pay gap is very low at the low end and it goes up and increases to be relatively high at the upper end of the wage distribution. So here the gender pay gap is not that defined at the low end, but it's highly, it's high at the upper end. If we look at Egypt, we find the gender pay gap is high at the low end, and in fact it becomes negative at the higher end. And if we look at Peru, it's completely the opposite to the Norway case, where the gender pay gap is very high at the low end and goes to be very low at the upper end. So clearly, here we see four examples which shows that the mean gender pay gap or the factor with the gender pay gap, that number that we estimate to come up with policy-driven conclusions in terms of how the gender pay gap is doing in a country is not really uh, explanatory of the phenomenon when, when we realize that actually the gender pay gap has different effects at different ends of the wage distribution. For example, why this may be important is because at the low end of the wage distribution, you may like to think of policies like the minimum wage in order to reduce the gender pay gap. In the middle of the wage distribution, you may think of collective bargaining as a way to reduce the gender pay gap. And at the 
upper end of the wage distribution, you may like to think of policies that allow for women to have a much higher representation in uh, top paying uh, uh, in top paying uh, positions uh, in uh, in for example, public companies. So it depends on where you look or where the gender pay gap is the higher or the lower, different policies will apply. That's why it's important not just to look at the number, but to look at where in the which distribution can we actually define the gender pay gap. If we go to the next slide, please. So what we've actually done in this report is to say, okay, just, just instead of looking at a, at a number, let's look at the process in order to understand the gender pay gap in any given country at a given time. Now, in this process, the first thing we will do is to look at the wage distribution. The second thing is to look at this factor weighted gender pay gap. The third thing, uh, if you click, uh, the third thing is to look at the different deciles to see how the gender pay gap is different at different positions of the wage distribution. And then finally, what we need to do is to think, okay, what causes the gender pay gap? Now, if we go to the next slide, for us to understand what causes the gender pay gap, we have to actually decompose the gender pay gap at each country and at each quantile. And the decomposition implies that we have to use a process, and that's already explained in the report, I will not go into details here, but use a process that allows us to disentangle the gender pay gap at each decile, so we can actually have one part that we call the explain part, meaning that we can actually explain the gender pay gap with uh, factors such as education, experience, occupation, industrial sectors, geographical region, etc. And then we can leave whatever is actually not explained by those factors that should somehow explain the wage determination process, that's what we call the unexplained part of the gender pay gap. So we did this in the report, now we're going to the next slide. And uh, what, what we actually found, we, you can see here, is that for each of the subgroups of countries, re, according to uh, economic uh, background of countries, it's uh, low middle income countries, upper middle, high income, and, world, and the world in general. What we have done is to uh, estimate the gender pay gap and decompose it so we have the unexplained part, the total explained part, that part which can be explained by factors that somehow objectively determine wages in the in, in, in the wage determination process. And then we have isolated that part that can be explained by education. Just to see, because in many different uh, economic contexts, uh, it has been said that the reason why there is a gender pay gap is, is because women are not as well, um, they don't have the same educational background as men, and that it, there is a need to push for women's education in order to reduce the gender pay gap. Okay, what we show in the report is that basically, much of the gender pay gap is in fact unexplained, because as you can see, the red bar is the one that dominates. We also find that in fact, women are better educated than men, and they, where they actually be paid their human capital in terms of education, the gender pay gap would actually be higher. And in only in low-income countries, we can see that there is a gender pay gap that may be explained because men have, let's say, better factors in terms of the wage determination process other than education than uh, can actually explain some of the difference. But for the vast majority of countries, irrespective of where we are in terms of uh, a economic background, uh, we find that the gender pay gap cannot actually be uh, explained by uh, objective factors. So if we go into the next slide. So the conclusions basically is that to a large extent the gender pay gap cannot be explained by objective factors associated with the wage determination process. The second thing that we show in the report is that education, for instance, is not an important factor and that in fact the report shows that among wage employees, women are better educated than men, no matter where we look in the wage distribution. And in fact, considering that women are not paid for their endowments and according to their characteristics and employment characteristics, estimates show an underestimation of the gender pay gap. So in fact, what we actually show is that if women were actually paid, for example, for their education, no matter where they are in the wage distribution, the gender pay gap would actually be much higher uh, than what it is today. So what are the factors that lie behind the unexplained part of the gender pay gap? If we go to the next uh, slide, please. So, okay, what we find is basically there is occupational segregation. That means that although women may have better education than men, 
women are not represented at the higher end of the occupational spectrum. And that actually has an impact on the gender pay gap. Then there is an undervaluation of work in feminized industry. So that means that women tend to occupy economic sectors that are highly feminized, and these economic sectors, that may be education, the health sector, are less valued by society, meaning that they actually receive uh, lower uh, earnings relative to other occupations where men may have similar economic backgrounds in terms of the wage determination process, but somehow in those other sectors, the wage is much higher. Then there is low participation of women in wage employment, particularly in middle and low income countries. And this low participation means that women are not, occup are not being uh, able to occupy the, the, the positions that you occupy, but it's men who are occupying them. So you have mm, a much higher density of women in unpaid work, uh, in unpaid family work than in uh, wage employment. And finally, uh, work-life balance is very important. We find that the motherhood penalty and the fatherhood premium is what determines the gender pay gap. And of course, these are not uh, productivity determinants. This is basically uh, the root causes of these. Uh, if you click again, what we find is basically the root causes of what we call the basic idea of discrimination is prejudice, stereotyping, cultural norms, and social expectations. And I'll show you one, one graph is in the next slide, please where we actually see the process of feminization. So here what we have done, we have a wage data from enterprises, about one million enterprises in Europe. And what we have done is we have sorted these enterprises according to the percentage of women within the enterprise, wage employees. From those which are the lowest at the left-hand side to those who have the highest percentage of women. Now the purple line, the first, the top one, what we see is that uh, in the, in the uh, vertical axis, and you find uh, the hourly wage that it's been paid in these enterprises. So basically, when we have very few women in these enterprises, the average wage per hour they, that these uh, wage employees, men and women, but wage employees receive, if it's about 12 euros per hour. As we increase the percentage of women up to 30%, 30% women, 70% men in these enterprises, the hourly wage increases, but after 30%, there is a kind of flat rate and then it starts to decrease drastically. And when we reach enterprises that have about 95 to 100% of women, we find that the hourly wage can be about two euros less per hour than those enterprises where women were not very uh, represented. Now, it could be for two things. One is that these enterprises at the low end, are basically at the when women are uh, highly represented, maybe they have low productivity. So what we did is a second thing, is to say, okay, let me take those enterprises that have identical characteristics to the enterprises where these women are working. For example, I take those enterprises where you have 5% of women and 95% of men, and I look at the characteristics of these enterprises in terms of productivity, so in terms of size, economic sector, etc. And I take the average wage paid at those enterprises that have similar characteristics irrespective of how, uh, how many women there are. And what we find, if we go at the upper end, if we go where you have 100% of women in these enterprises. If you look at this, we see that when uh, women are 100%, the hourly wage is 10 euro, uh, euros per hour, but enterprises that are identical to them in productivity, irrespective of whether you have more or less women, they're getting paid around 11.5 euros per hour. So basically, there is a gap here, which is about 15% gap between enterprises with similar productivity profile and those with the same profile, but a lot of women on them. And this actually translates into about 4,000 euros per year in earnings difference on average in the case of Europe. So if we go to the next slide. Okay, so we see what is the way forward. Okay, so well, basically, we understand that uh, why there is a gender pay gap cannot actually be explained by those factors that determines the wage determination process, such as education, experience, etc. So now, wage policies need to be put forward in order to reduce the gender pay gap. Wage policies and, of course, strengthening collective bargaining uh, with matters that relate to wage discrimination between women and men. We need to be 
to, to use policies that reduce the participation cost for women, particularly for women with children and dependent. And if these policies are put in place, they will be able to participate uh, with uh, men in order to reduce the, uh, the gender pay gap because of things like uh, having to participate in part-time work, in employment that is not related to their education, in order to fit, to fit their, uh, uh, their life uh, constraints. Now, there's also a need for legal framework and transparency laws because if you have the legal framework in a country but you don't have the transparency laws or transparency instruments to allow for women to see whether they're getting paid less or more than men, then clearly the legal frameworks will not have any effect. And there's also a need for education for diversification because we need to have diversification in enterprises between women and men in order to reduce the fact that some of those uh, enterprises and some of those sectors that are mostly related to women are somehow viewed by society as having less value. Now, the desire of come, of course, is to reduce prejudice and stereotyping and change norms and expectations with regards to women and men's participation behavior in the labor market. And the target is, of course, the UN Agency for 2030, as uh, well stated by uh, EPIC, which is the Equal Pay uh, International Coalition, and uh, which is embodied in uh, one of the uh, SDGs, which is SDG 8.5. So the next slide will be the final one which is if you want more information and the full report then you have here the links for you to be able to have a look at it so thank you very much for your attention i hope this has been somehow clear to you <laughs> thank you so much rosalia i think there are a lot of questions already but because we um short a bit on time we'll and because you mentioned EPIC, we will go directly to Lisa's presentation. So the next speaker is Lisa Wong, Senior Administrator, Coordinator, Governance and Tripartite Department at ILO. Lisa, over to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Diana. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. And I'd just like to welcome all the participants to 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 this webinar and also to thank Rosalia for that excellent presentation and for also starting a little introduction on EPIC because that's what I'm here to talk to you about. So let's start. I know we're short on time. So EPIC, the Equal P International Coalition, uh, was a brainchild, no, let's stay on the first <laughs> slide, please. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, was actually the brainchild of the, the ILO, and why? Because we, the ILO, we are the custodians of the international convention which deals with equal remuneration and which encompasses equal pay which is equal pay for equal work as well as equal pay for work of equal value. So when the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, Ag Agenda 2030 was adopted, we decided you know, we, that we had to, to do something. We started discussing with the UN, UN women, of course, because this is uh, very close to their hearts as well, and uh, with the OECD. And we decided that the only way to, to try to achieve the target set by the uh, 2030 agenda, target 8.5 on equal pay, we thought we would join forces and uh, make this, m develop this multi-stakeholder coalition. Okay, so to reiterate, it's led by the ILO UN women and the OECD, and it is meant as uh, an inclusive initiative of stakeholders who are committed to reducing the gender pay gap, which we just heard a lot about, and achieving equal pay for work of equal value. Next slide. Okay, so as I said there, first of all, why why did we why did we set this up i gave a little background i gave a little background to that but equal pay as i said encompasses two concepts it's about equal pay for equal work which means that equally qualified men and women who perform the same or similar jobs in equivalent conditions receive equal pay i think that's that's clear 
But what's a little bit more difficult to grasp is the idea of equal pay for work of equal value, which is what this SDG target is about. And this here, put in very basic terms, is where women and men perform jobs which differ in content, but based on objective criteria such as qualifications, effort, responsibility and working conditions, when you look at those objective criteria across the board, you find that they are the jobs, even though they differ in content, can be of equal value and therefore should be paid equally. Now, why, why is it important? Um, I'd say more unequal and fairly paid jobs for women translate into more women joining and remaining in the labor market. We have attract, we attract talent, reduce turnover, and have higher morale and therefore productivity. You have, women have a higher purchasing power for them and their families, and higher consumption levels, and higher aggregate demand. You also end up with healthier and more educated children. You end up with less women in poverty, including in older age, and you have more an equal distribution of domestic chores and care work between women and men in the family. So how does EPIC uh, plan to achieve what it's going to achieve? As I said, it's a multi-stakeholder initiative. So while it's led by these three organizations, it's meant to engage with governments, employers, workers and their organizations, private sector, civil society, academia, okay? all taking concrete steps to accelerate and close the gender care pay gap and to achieve pay equity. Now, the idea is that EPIC will work at the global, na uh, regional and national levels. It will focus on promoting universal ratification of that uh, Equal Remuneration Convention that I, I mentioned at the beginning and to improving its implementation to enhancing national equal pay legislation and uh, enforcement to producing data, monitoring trends in respect to the gender pay gap and policies to curb it, fostering knowledge sharing through peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, capacity building, providing technical advisory services, uh, providing support to governments, enterprises, workers and employers organizations to advance equal pay, and promoting gender responsive uh, policies and measures to reduce the gender pay gap. Now, for EPIC to operate credibly and effectively, we have divided it up into three parts. We have the secretariat, we have the steering committee, and we have members. Now, the day-to-day -day operations of EPIC are managed by the Secretariat, which are the three organizations, the ILO, the OECD, and UN Women. Um, for, the, uh, it's, for the steering committee, we have the um, Secretariat actually approached uh, governments, countries, let's call it that, and representatives of employers and workers, so the International Organization of Employers and the International Trade Union Confederation to, part, to form part of this, to, to form this steering committee. Okay, um, these members of the steering committee are subject to the same criteria for engagement as all other EPIC members, all right? Um, uh, the ideally, we're, we're trying to get at least one country per region or at a maximum two per region. As you'll see for the Americas, we have Canada and Panama as part of the steering committee. For Europe, we have Switzerland and Iceland, and then there's South Africa and Jordan. Uh, the Republic of Korea was part of the EPIC steering committee for the first year, but they did tell us at the beginning that it would just be for year one of operation. We've now entered year two of operation, 
and we are currently engaging with the uh, governments of Japan and Indonesia uh, to consider taking over to, to consider taking over that role as the steering committee. Now, of course, as we like to say, being part of EPIC is just not, you know, it's, a, it's not a free ride. We want to make sure that all those who want to join and be members of EPIC are genuine and genuine and have like proven commitment to, to achieving equal pay and equal, uh, to reducing the gender pay gap, whether it be within their own organizations, their companies, or at the national level, and to achieving equal pay and equal pay for work of equal value. So the steering committee has come up with criteria for engagement. For governments, there are 11 identified criteria, of which at least six must be complied with. For trade unions, they came up with seven for which uh, uh, at least four must be complied with. Uh, for the private sector, there are also seven for which four must be complied with. And since there are a lot of uh, private sector here with us today, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about in terms of criteria, we're looking at uh, companies that have gender equality or diversity policies in place, for example. We are, the previous slide please, we are looking at uh, companies that aim to take corrective action to eliminate uh, discrimination in pay, companies which are willing to share best practices and to raise awareness. For the act for academia, uh, there are five identified criteria, and we're looking at uh, them achieving at least complying with at least four. Okay, we're way ahead of where where I'm supposed to be. Can we go back, please? Two slides. Go back again. Thank you. Okay, great. And uh, for civil society, we are looking at, um, we have identified four criteria and um, we're asking civil society organizations to comply with at least three of those. Um, uh, now we can go to, to the next slide, please. Okay, so prior to the launch of EPIC, which took place in, the, in September 2017 at the General Assembly, the uh, Secretariat organized a stakeholder meeting in Berlin to shape EPIC's vision, which was essentially to learn from potential stakeholders what uh, EPIC's focus should be, to make sure that we were going to be responding to uh, possible stakeholders or participants, uh, members' needs. Following the launch, we the global launch at in New York in 2017, we then had regional launches in Latin America and the Caribbean and also in Asia Pacific. What's not on this slide is one that was held just at the end of December 2018 for, for French-speaking Africa. And the purpose of these launches were really to raise awareness about the existence of EPIC, learn what could be of interest to potential stakeholders in these regions, for example, whether they thought they wanted EPIC to focus for them on more awareness raising, or whether they needed more research done in their regions, or whether what they'd want was more you know, concrete how to do, how to tools as we call them. Um, then we had an we had last year as well an epic steering committee meeting the first meeting of the steering committee which met to establish those criteria for engagement and to take decisions on uh, other operational issues and last September we had a very high level pledging event during the General Assembly again in New York, where we gathered global leaders from governments, private sector, trade unions and civil society. And there we received over 40 pledges to do more or better work on reducing the gender pay gap within their own spheres of influence and to achieving equal pay for equal work and work of equal value. Next slide, please. Next slide. 
Yeah. Okay. So what do we plan for 2018? We plan to continue with those regional launches. There's one plan for the Arab states, and we're also planning one for the English and Louisophone uh, speaking countries in Africa. We plan to develop uh, more tools to make it more uh, and make them more uh, accessible to to its mem to Epic members. We're under we are undertaking impact assessment studies to see what's been uh, to sort of document the impact of national level initiatives and to share this information with other countries, those that are interested in, in doing a sort of analysis of, okay, what's been done in country A and B and what's similar, where do we fall and what could we, you know, possibly follow. We're considering expanding these impact assessment studies to the private sector because we know a lot of companies are out there are doing a lot of work on not only trying to uh, reduce the gender pay, the, the pay gap within their within their companies, but also to attract more women in the workforce. And you know there are a lot of other companies out there globally because of course this is a global initiative that would be interested in learning from you. So we're considering that as well. We're also looking at organising very technical meetings. Uh, similar to, uh, there is one being planned, for example, in Iceland in April, uh, which is going to be looking at promoting better indicators, statistics, data, and policies to reduce the gender pay gap. Um, we are also developing a knowledge sharing platform, which will uh, be part of the, uh, will be available on the EPIC website as soon as it's finalized. And just to conclude, if we go to the last slide, please. Right, um, their EPIC does have a website. The title is very long. It's equalpayinternationalcoalition.org. Uh, but once you type it in once into your browser and you type equal, it will start coming up. So please, I encourage you to, to visit the website. We do have a Twitter. We're, we're active on Twitter and Facebook. And of course, we have a dedicated mailbox, epic at ilo.org. Uh, where we receive, you know, daily several requests for membership, etc., and we start engaging on a one-on-one -on -one with potential members or to answer any questions uh, that anyone may have on Epic. So please feel free to to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for such a detailed and wonderful presentation. I'm sure there are many other questions, but I will kindly ask Agustina to join the presentations and to share the perspective from the international organization of employer side. Agustina, over to you. Thank you for organizing this webinar. Um, I'll be presenting a short verbal presentation. Um, the International Organization of Employers, the IOE, is based in Geneva and we represent the views and interests of more than 150 employer organizations as well, uh, and well over 50 million companies from around the world, big and small. We are the Secretariat of the Employers Group at the ILO, and we will turn 100 years old next year. So with regards to the Equal Pay, uh, to Equal Pay International Coalition, EPIC, as mentioned by Lisa before, um, the IOE is part of the steering committee, which decides and drives the work of EPIC, and uh, we are happy to be a member of the steering committee. Now, why is it important for the IOE to be part of EPIC? It's important for three reasons. The first reason is that the work of EPIC adds value to the IOE's own work on gender equality and diversity. The second reason is it provides a platform for the IOE and its members federations to express their views and ideas on how to tackle the gender pay gap. And the third reason is that we all know that the ILO UN Women and OECD have the resources to better understand the barriers that women face and can come up with policy action to tackle this issue at the, lab, uh, at the global, regional and national level. It, is, it therefore gives us access to experts in the field and this will give us a chance to not only learn from them but also give our constructive, uh, constructive input to their work from a business perspective. We believe in effective and practical solutions to generate impact. 
Now, the added value of uh, the IOE in this initiative is that we can leverage our network of not only employee organizations, but also various partner companies. It is therefore important for the IOE to work closely with the Epic Secretariat on the peer-to-peer -peer learning exchanges to discuss what works and what doesn't. Um, we'd like also to be engaged in the knowledge sharing activities and also be involved in uh, research. We also provide proposals to the criteria of engagement, which Lisa kindly mentioned, to join EPIC, and we would like to be engaged throughout the whole um, EPIC process. So, we, so that way we can inform our member federations and partner companies on the latest developments and discussions on this topic and give them the opportunity to share best practices at the international level as well. Now, DIOE also made a pledge um, to EPIC, and I will read it out. Strengthen our action to promote gender equality and non-discrimination good practices as part of our commitment to preserve and defend fundamental principles and rights at work while paying special attention to gender-based discrimination in pay. We also have some planned activities um, throughout the year. We are planning to celebrate International Women's Day on March 8th with a webinar with our members to raise awareness on gender issues, including the gender pay gap. We will continue to provide policy guidance to our members and com uh, company partners on gender equality and diversity. This in turn will enable um, the advocacy part on their, in their respective countries and sphere, sphere of influence. We of course will continue to provide technical assistance, advice and support to companies and mem our members when needed. Of course, harnessing the potential and the collective strengths of our members is what we do best. We also have a policy paper on um, unleashing female talent and a compilation of best practices from our members. Um, this comp compilation was made with the help of our colleagues from the Bureau of Act Employers Activities at the ILO. So I'll just read out just a few examples of uh, the best practices of what our members are doing. Uh, uh, take an example of Iran, for example. They have um, partnered with civil society by forming an umbrella organization to promote gender equality in the context of the SDGs. They offer training on international um, training opportunities to staff on gender equality. Our member from Venezuela, for example, Fede Camaras, they supported the formal constitution of a civil association called Venezuelan Business Alliance for the Leadership of Women, which aims to encourage female leadership and employment in the private sector. Um, two more examples. The, the, another example is from Uganda. Um, they conduct gender equality training for member organizations. They have an alumni, which conducts um, mentoring for young female professionals. I, I found that really interesting. They also implemented the ILO uh, Start and Improve Your Business program with a particular focus on women. They also have human resources manuals to address uh, preventing harassment um, uh, and violence at work. They also um, uh, adopted the UN uh, Women's Empowerment Principles and encouraged members to promote these principles. Um, our, and lastly, our member from the US, USCIB, they have organized uh, workshops on employment, education, and entrepreneurship with OECD PIAC. They work with us on gender issues. They have non-discrimination policies in place. They have clear policies on preventing harassment at work, and they also have these flexible working arrangements for all staff in place. So these are just few of the examples of what our members are doing, and um, we, we take the opportunity to share this uh, with EPIC uh, as a, a consolidated uh, compilation of good practices from our, our members. Uh, you can also um, uh, review the full compilation on our website, or you can contact me directly uh, uh, the, on the website. I have my contact details there, www.ioe-emp.org, and um, you find all the details there. So with this, uh, I finish my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Agustina. Um, it will be useful uh, um, uh, to know for everyone, for all the participants, that we will share all these links that are mentioned by the speakers in a follow-up emails, including the presentation and the video link of the recording. So just to assure you that you will receive all the information that our panelists are kindly sharing. Um, so because Agustina started with useful examples and practices, practical um examples from what the um, stakeholders do. I would like to go next to Chris Martin from Starbucks, who is man who manages the global pay equity programs uh, at the Starbucks, and he will be able to share a little bit more about their efforts and policies and internal regulations that helps them be a leader in this uh, field and represent a good uh, example for other companies. Chris, over to you. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Chris. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, so um, thank you for organizing the webinar, and we are um, we at Starbucks are privileged to be a part of the um, Epic Pledge and the and the organization here. I am going to cut my remarks a little bit short uh, and focus on a couple of practical policy changes that we've made at Starbucks um, aiming towards pay equity. Um, one of our uh, one of our core values is um, connecting with transparency, dignity, and respect, and this work really supports and reaffirms that that core value that we have at Starbucks. Um, so. We, we do a lot of measurement at Starbucks looking um, to see whether or not people are getting paid equally regardless of their gender or uh, racial and ethnic background. Um, and that measurement is critical to our, our success in, um, in this work. I'm going to focus on some other changes that we've made to policies that are more concrete um, and uh, that can be communicated more easily without getting into the details of that analysis. So uh, there are two things that I'm going to talk about. One is we remove arbitrary caps on pay increases for promotions. So if pay increases associated with promotions do not keep pace with the labor market, employees that work their way up the ranks end up earning less than their peers that were recruited to join from, a, from the external labor market. Uh, treating promotions and recruits equally is, of course, good business practice for retaining loyal talent. But it also, we found, has an implication for pay equity. So we have seen in our workforce that certain groups tend to stay with the company longer than others. Uh, so some workers are more mobile between employers, whereas others tend to stick around for longer, at least at Starbucks. Um, so when this is the case, those differences, if we treat promotions and external, external hires differently in terms of pay, uh, that can lead to pay inequities along the line of gender and race. So we tried to introduce more standardization and ensure that our recruiting function uh, was in lockstep with our HR function to make sure that when someone got promoted into a position, they were paid the same as if they had been uh, hired externally. The second policy that we've changed is we stopped asking candidates for their salary history in the interview process. Um, this is important because this keeps us from importing pay inequities that exist in the labor market. So, of course, there is a place uh, for the discussion of compensation at an early stage in the um, interview process to ensure that budgets and expectations are comparable. But this change changed the way that we anchor that conversation and ensures that we do not import pay inequities from the labor market into, um, into our organization. So the, the logic here is that um, if in the external labor market women, women are paid less than men, for the same job. When we ask for their salary histories, the numbers that we'll be getting from women will tend to be lower uh, for the same work. And so they'll start that conversation about compensation in a, in a lower, um, at a lower point. And so that may import those pay inequities into, into our organization. So uh, these are just two examples of policies that we have implemented at Starbucks, um, aiming towards gender pay equity. Uh, there's always more work to be done. Um, in attracting and motivating female talent and diverse talent. Um, and we would just like to reaffirm our commitment uh, 
uh, it's the pledge that we made in September with Epic. Um, and I will leave, you'll be receiving a, a slide that details some of our work. We divide our work into three different areas, one on equal footing, one on transparency, and one on accountability. Um, and so you can see some more details in that infographic. Um, and I will end my remarks there. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. I think this is uh, a wonderful example. <laughs> and I can't wait to go to the Q&A sessions to discuss a little bit more. I already see the questions coming. Um, let's go next to Sari uh, Brody from uh, IKEA Group, uh, who comes. Uh, she leads the global equality, diversity, and inclusion. And uh, I'm sure she also has interesting um, policy, internal action that IKEA is taking on. And uh, we are looking forward to hear more about uh, um, the IKEA initiatives on this front. Uh, Sari, back to you. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Sorry. Oh, good. All oh, good. good. All I, good. It looked like <laughs> I was muted. <laughs> so, hi, Justin. Uh, maybe we can start with the presentation because we are uh, lacking of time. Um, so, um, we actually met Starbucks in the Epic in the September event in New York. So it's kind of nice to hear other corporations that are pledging to pay equally for work of equal value. At IKEA, we have a main policy, a main strategy now among our top business strategies, and it's going all in on equality. So what we have done is we signed the Women Economic Principles. Um, we were also on the Committee of um, Women Empowerment Principles, and if you uh, switch to the next slide. I will just share um, briefly of um, our commitment and then maybe I will take a minute to show what we have done so far. Um, so yeah, so we, we signed the high level, we were a part of the high level panel on women econ economic empowerment together with the Costa Rica um, in, a president and we committed to equal pay then. So we have still the ambition that by 2020, we will have equal pay for work of equal value. If you can um, move a slide. So for that, we developed a very clear, no, the previous one, we, we developed a very clear corporate framework. Um, global, and then we use it for all of our location. This is how to work with um, equal pay, and um, and we have some actions that have been taken in the market. So if you switch another slide. In our pledge in September, what we said is that we will develop this and we will roll it to all of our 30 countries where we have operation by January 1st. So obviously it has been rolled and we started already the assessment for every single country to see where we are at and what is the gap in every single country. Um, we also committed to conducting an annual assessment because we have a few countries that have already accomplished um, equal pay, pay equity. And what we realized is that we, if we don't continue um, conducting those assessments, we slip and we go back to 2% difference, 3% different, all the way up to 5% different. So now we are also committing to doing an annual assessment and reporting on it. Next slide, please. And um, the way we report on this is we have the IKEA group yearly summary and we have some other channels where on a yearly basis we both share where are we with, when it comes to 
gender equality, gender balance in all leadership position and in all functions and organization. And now we will also add the, the equal pay. And where are we with that? So I think this might be my last slide that you have. Is that right? Yes, this is the last we have. Yes. So I just wanted to say that our journey started actually in 2010. We developed comp a comp and ban principles for non-discrimination in pay. So it's not only gender, it's uh, all dimensions of diversity. And then in 2012, we've done an analysis for all of our executive management positions, the top 200 in IKEA, and immediately made adjustment so that we have equal pay regardless of your gender, regardless of your nationality. And then in 2013 and 14, we've done analysis in certain countries. So some countries that we felt need to focus more on it, five of them have done the analysis and started working on it already. And by the 2016, we brought it to our supervisory board and agreed that on an annual basis, we will commit to budgeting and um, covering up for pay gap. Um, in 2017, we put a task force together and we launched the pay assessment tool to all market in the end of 2018. And every single market, every single country is working now with an external auditor to see where they are at um, and taking into consideration quite a few um, criteria that I will not now go into since we don't have that much time. Um, yeah, we work all the way from um, hourly rate for example, in Japan, hourly rate for part-timer is half the hourly rate of a full-timer. And as you might all guess, women hold more than 90% of the part-time position. So in IKEA, we equaled it now. All of our part-timer get exactly the same hourly rate as our full-timer. And we are now working with the government to see how do we uh, reconcile those differences. So in every country, we have some different measures of how to work with equal pay. And um, I will stop here to enable the next phases. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Sari. Um, very useful information. And I, because of interest of time, and we apologize, uh, we went a little bit over, but we wanted to give the opportunity to all the participants and panelists to uh, share the presentation as they envision. So next time, maybe we will be more careful in organizing it for one hour and a half, or maybe to organize it in two different webinars. Um, there are many questions, and we will select all of them and we will try to respond individually. But as for now, I selected um, uh, four and um, maybe I will share in a loud voice the question and then give each of the panelists the opportunity to choose the question they want to respond and quickly provide some feedback. I hope it works well with everyone. Um, and as mentioned prior, we will make sure to share the recording and email um, all the necessary links so you can get more information. In case you'll have additional question, please feel free to contact us and we will be able to share and come back with additional more detailed information. So question number one, please um, clarify or maybe a little bit more um, give a little bit more details of what do you mean when you say work of equal value? Number two, how many, um, can you provide an example of legislative commitment? Number three, how could any be involved, any country be involved or join the EPIC coalition? And number four, question number four, how an individual employee or at, at the individual level can um, get involved in all the activities um, that you, you mentioned throughout your presentation? 
Um, these are the questions, and I would uh, ask our panelists to kindly respond quickly to anyone, any of these questions that they want. And Rosalia, maybe we can start with you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so I'll have a go at questions one and two. Uh, the first one is the one that says clarify more uh, the meaning of work for equal value. Perhaps Lisa may like to add something afterwards, but one thing it's important to, to realize is that the word value sometimes is difficult to, to capture. Uh, at the end of the day, if we put po for, uh, policies forward, what we want to do is to monitor them and to make an assessment to see if they work. And to do so, we have to put policies that somehow can be sub uh, objectively captured by the, the, by the data. And the word value is somehow a, a, a very subjective uh, word. But nevertheless, it's true that what we see sometimes is that when let's just say the value added per worker that's the productivity the worker brings in the enterprise or to the economy is that brought about by enterprises or sectors where women predominate nevertheless although the added value per worker may be identical to other sectors where men dominate women get less pay so that's one way in which we can actually clarify the work uh, value basically is what value does the work that women do uh, have for society for example in terms of uh, domestic workers or people who care for children or care for the elderly the value is very high but somehow society doesn't seem to value it highly enough so these uh, these particular workers whether they are men or women seem to have less uh, paid for, for their work and of course in this type of employment women predominate so the work value uh, is somehow difficult to capture but then nevertheless we do have a great deal of evidence to suggest that highly valued work by society work that for which if it was not the society would not work as effectively as it does today is not valued because somehow women seem to participate higher in them and then in terms of legislative commitment well you have a lot of countries where there is a legislation that penalizes uh, difference or discrimination in pay but you don't have the the actual commitment because you don't have the instruments for example uh, in the case of uh, Germany lately they've put a law by which enterprises that have more than 250 employees are such that women who work in those enterprises are allowed to uh, look at the hourly wage paid by to their peer men uh, workers because if that's the only way they can find out uh, if they are discriminated in terms of wages, if they, if they have the information and then when they know, they can take advantage of the legal system, of the legislation. And that's what we call by legisl legislative commitment. So these are the answers to the, the, the first two questions on my behalf. Thank you so much, Rosalia. Let me go over to Agustina. Agustina, are you still online? I, knew, I know that you had a hard stop, so... Um... Let's see, um, maybe we can continue with Lisa. Okay, yes, thank you, Diana. And I do believe that Agustina had to leave um, and she says that any messages can be sent. She can be reached by email. Yes, very quickly on uh, two questions. I'd just like to go back to the clarifying a little bit more on uh, what's meant by work of equal value, if you don't mind. Here we're talking about, as I said, where men and women do different work, where the work differs in content, it involves different responsibilities, it demands different skills, it demands different qualifications, and is performed under different conditions. But there is a way of determining whether to such jobs, which are different, content, value, skills, etc., etc., are equal in value, okay? And that's where you get involved with uh, what we call, where we do what we call gender-neutral evaluations, 
okay, where we use objective criteria to determine whether these jobs are equal in value. And if they turn out to be equal in value, if they end up with the same number of points, essentially they should be paid equally. And uh, I'm talking, for example, we can compare a male storage assistant, for example, which is pretty much a male-dominated job, compared to a female caretaker, okay? And uh, those jobs have been, in particular countries, um, assessed using these gender-neutral job um, evaluation criteria, and it turned out that essentially they, um, they were equal in value, even though they're totally different jobs. So just, just uh, very quickly on that. And uh, um, if you don't mind me, sorry, jumping to another question because I do have another meeting and need to leave. Sure, maybe uh, you can quickly share with us how anyone uh, should join EPIC. Join EPIC, <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so there, uh, the first thing you can do is please send an email to epic at ilo.org. And uh, uh, another colleague and I both handle that mailbox and we will get back to you. Just come to us and say, listen, we are interested in joining EPIC and then we will start the conversation. That's probably the very easiest way. Alternatively, please visit our website and there is a box on the website that says get involved. If after you've read everything and you think, ah, oh, this sounds, you know, even more interesting than what Lisa said, please just click on that get involved button. And really and truly what it does is that it sends you to an email box, which ends up being that same box at epic at ilo.org, and we'll be able to to move back and forward on a on a one on one on that. Is thank that you, okay? Lisa. Thank you. Um, go. We will go next to Chris. Uh, Chris, please. Uh, hello. Yeah, I, I'll speak really quickly to the final question, which is, what can we as individuals do um, to get involved in this work? Um, so it, my comments apply most uh, readily to the United States where I'm more familiar with gender dynamics um, and power dynamics, uh, although I suspect that they would also apply to other countries as well. Um, and I will say that I'll, I'll target my comments towards the 9% of men in the audience uh, specifically, um, though I think this applies to women as well. Um, there, the conversation with employers needs to, needs to happen um, and I think some of us are, are forward thinking about this, and I think there are still some, some employers who are behind the times. So what I would encourage um, us to do uh, is to have conversations with our employers, whether that is our current employers or when we're in the job searching process. Uh, so when we're interviewing with employers and just ask basic questions about what they are doing to ensure that um, gender or ethnicity or any other aspect of a person's identity are not um, factoring into that person's compensation. Um, and I think we can broaden that conversation to uh, not strictly compensation, but also uh, representation and empowerment in the workplace um, and promotability. And uh, by asking those questions, particularly when those of us who have been historically empowered in the workplace ask those questions, uh, we put the onus on employers to, to get better answers and better programs um, suited to addressing the issues there. Um, so I think that certainly there are certainly there are policies that need to take place at the national level, um, and it's sort of a different conversation. And individual engagement there is a little trickier, um, although we can engage through the political process. But I think that that's a concrete step that we can have is. Uh, converse with our employers or prospective employers um, and engage with them on this topic. Uh, and I think it's something that we can encourage our peers and our communities to do as well. Um, so when they see that this is something that the labor market uh, requires and demands, um, then I think everyone will need to get serious about it. Thank you, Chris, and we will make sure to share these links where everyone will be able to understand how does this look in a more, you know, a real kind of act, activity way, how to engage uh, individually. And Sari, um, let's go over to you so you can share the final thoughts with our stakeholders. Maybe I can share also how do we work with the work of equal value. 
So we have four measures, actually, that every country is uh, required to do. One is the headline gap. So it's the typical um, title of your job, but we all know that it's, it's not adjusted. For example, store manager in one country is not like a store manager in another country. Size of store, competence, performance, etc. But we still do that. Then we add also a cluster gap, and we have um, an IPE, international pay evaluation, that we put the same jobs in the in the category. So even if it's not this exactly the same job, but it's we feel it's work of equal value, and we work with external consultant to determine what jobs go into this IPE. And then we do weighted average pay for the same job level in the same market. The third day component is the IBE gap. Here we ask our countries to look at the individual IPE and to compare IPE level in the same market. So if we have a store manager or a function manager that share the same IPE, we ask every country to compare them um, and then see in your own market, accounting for all the differences in the market, how do you pay um, for men and women and for people of different nationalities? And then finally, we do identical group gap. So when we have the same IPE and the same position in the same market, and then we look also, in this case, into the competence and the performance of the leaders, because what we realize is that that weighs a lot in our organization. The number of years they've been in position, their competence, and their performance. So we have four criteria for, in the end, we will get into what does it mean for IKEA to pay for um, work of equal value. Thank you so much, Sari, for sharing the criteria. Um, I'm sure this discussion w could continue, and maybe it will be useful in the next month, upcoming of 2019, so we can revisit and see in a, uh, and uh, discuss all of these uh, criteria and policies in a more detailed approach. But for now, we would like to thank all the participants um, and panelists, and uh, um, let's see if our stakeholders who attended the webinar got a little bit more information from um, um, from the presentation and everything we shared today. And as mentioned prior, if you would like to receive information and updates about this topic, a Women Empowerment Principle, or broadly about the programs mentioned and We Empower Program, please contact us at we.empower at unwoman.org. And if you don't mind, we will launch a poll now to understand the, um, how satisfied are you with the information received. This will be a good indication for us if we uh, could organize something else on this uh, topic, um, maybe um, uh, um, more uh, another webinars with more companies or a more theoretical approach. So we will appreciate your feedback. Thank you so much for sharing your feedback. 48% um, are very satisfied. And uh, let's go to the next questions, which um, please share with us after this webinar, how informed are you with policies on equal pay? For the previous question, we also saw a lot of responses on somehow satisfied. So if you have any suggestion how we can do it better, please also connect with us. We are always eager to hear you and to respond to your requests. Thank you so much for replying. Uh, we are very happy that 55% are informed or somehow more informed 
And again, we will uh, looking forward to receive your feedback and to make it a better session next time. And for the closing remarks, we are inviting Laura Dati, our colleague from ILO, to share with us the final thoughts. Thank you so much, Diana. And on behalf of UN Women and the ILO and uh, our donor, the EU, would like to sincerely thank the panelists for contributing their diverse and valuable perspectives to today's discussion. As the Global Wills report shows, the gender pay gap remains a persistent problem touching nearly every country. The momentum built by coalitions such as EPIC and the policy and company initiatives we heard about today will help to bring us closer to addressing this social injustice. We would like to thank the public, for your engagement on such an important topic and your very many thought-provoking questions. We will revert to you individually. We really hope that this discussion has been helpful to you in your journey towards achieving pay equity. And we really hope to stay connected as we work together towards this goal. We would like to thank the European Union, um, our donor, and um, also the, the teams, the UN Women and ILO teams in New York and Geneva for the great support in organizing the webinar. As the ILO, its constituents and partners celebrate 100 years of advancing social justice and promoting decent work in 2019, we look forward to a future of work when inequalities such as the gender pay gap are history. A 20% gender pay gap on a global level is unacceptable and must be addressed. Tackling its root causes has to start with a commitment, as we heard, uh, to, the, to the fundamental principle of equal pay for work of equal value, as also called by SDGA. This commitment then must be translated into further research, better data, greater co collaboration and sharing of good practices, but also the adoption of legal and policy frameworks and actions to ultimately assure equal pay and gender equality at work everywhere. I thank you all and um, looking forward to the next opportunity to exchange. Thank you, Diana. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you so much, everyone. We apologize to, to go a little bit more uh, beyond the time, the scheduled time, but I hope it was an interesting and useful topic for everyone. We appreciate your participation and look forward for next webinars. Goodbye. Thank you.